Um, but what we know now is, <clears throat> first of all, that our, our guts and our immune systems are very social. And they want lots and lots and lots of exposures. They want diverse compounds, like different kinds of foods. They want lots of different organisms. This is part of the education, ongoing, lifelong of our immune systems. And it turns out of our brains. Hello, Dr. Maya. You Hi. know, I want to publicly say this. I, I, you know, I'm like, I love your work. The way you stand up for yourself, the way you talk, you know, I had this drive in me always to, you know, I was always like, you know, towards plants and everything, but to speak up and to blend it. Oh my God, you do it so beautifully. And then I found this, your book. Yeah. And I was like, wow, you know, like, so it was like, ah, I got the book and I read it. I read it and I was like, wow, I am a big, big, big fan of you. and. Uh, so would you be, I mean, would you tell people who are listening that you are a medical doctor, you are a neurologist and how, you know, from that conventional medicine, how you shifted and what led you to shift? Well, I think a lot of people assume that I started out very conventional, but actually the reason that I went to medical school um, was because or at least the instigator was because I saw uh, a, a program called Healing and the Mind by Bill Moyers. And I was probably, I guess, in early college at the time. And it was all about these luminaries in the area of mind body healing. And, um, you know, I think like, Deepak Chopra was on it and like various other people who now, you know, are obviously um, very you know, exalted in the field. And one of the stories that they did was on a young girl who had lupus and she was in kidney failure from her meds. But when they'd stop her meds, she would have progression of her disease. And so they started to give her castor oil every time she got her meds. And then eventually they stopped giving her the meds, but continued to give her castor oil by itself on the same schedule. And her body responded as though she were getting her meds, but without oh. any side effects. And I was amazed by that. And they called this a new field of medicine called psychoneuroimmunology. And I thought, I'm interested in that. That is why I want to go to med school. And I wrote an essay about it. And I mean, it wasn't that explicit, but I definitely wrote that in my medical school essay. And they let me into medical school. You know, I guess it was a good essay. <laughs> and, um, and I then was thrown into this really programming environment, right? When I say programming, I mean higher education in general, and certainly in the medical professions, are really about programming you know, and we call it a lot of things. We call it standard of care. We call it, you know, many, many names, you know, evidence-based medicine, a lot of things. But really what it comes down to is it's uh, creating a way of thinking and a lens by which we have to do everything. And it's very limiting. It's a very specific, you know, and I'll say conventional just because that's what it's turned into right? So that we can't really think for ourselves beyond whatever framework we've been given. And so I was in that, obviously, for many years, right? I mean, I was in four years of med school, and then I took an extra year and did research. So then I did, you know, residency, then I did fellowship in adult and pediatric neurology. So it was like the better part of a decade in this programming environment, right? And and I also, you know, got married and had three kids over the course of my training. So by the end of that training, I didn't really remember why I'd gone into medical school to begin with. But my son got sick okay. when I was in my neurology training, my youngest son, and he developed asthma symptoms. 
and neurologic symptoms that came along with it, which were really like a developmental regression, I would say. And, um, you know, some of the examples of what happened, just because I think this audience might be interested, yeah, yeah. along yeah. with his breathing symptoms were, you know, he had been a very early speaker at about eight months at his first words. And uh, at a year of age, when his asthma symptoms began, he stopped gaining any new words for a long period of time. He didn't lose language, but he didn't gain language for months. And then he also lost his protective reflexes. So when he'd fall, he would just fall on his face and he wouldn't catch himself with his hands. Um, and he also started to like hit his head when he was angry. He did this, you know, I mean, there are kids who do that, but for him, it was new. And, you know, as a pediatric neurologist, in kind of the last phases of my training, it was obviously very alarming. And uh, I took him to his pediatrician, I took him to my own colleagues in neurology. And everyone was just very blase about it. Well, he's kind of an, you know, he's an allergic kid. And I don't see anything so problematic. And, you know, just kind of normalizing something that I could see was not normal at all for him. And so that put me in a position, as mothers often do, to start questioning everything, everything I'd learned and everything I was learning. Um, and I did what I'd been taught to do, which was look in the scientific literature. And despite the fact that the scientific literature is very biased in a lot of ways because of funding and what gets published and what gets retracted and so on and so forth, depending on, you know, politics and a lot of other things. Um, you know, I always think it's funny when people say, you know, I believe in science. It's like science is not something you believe in. Science is a process of discovery that's mm -hmm. constantly creating new questions every time you get answers, right? So there's no I believe in science. It's not science is settled. That's just not what science is. Science is really mm -hmm. a language. Mm -hmm. uh, but ultimately, I went into the scientific literature and started to realize that food was actually causing a lot of issues for him. Um, and I eventually found a doctor after going to also some of the best allergists in the world, supposedly, and being told I'm a hysterical mom, you know, even though I was a doctor, his dad was a doctor, right? All of this, that he was a soy allergic kid and that, and taking him off of soy ultimately really was the first step in his process of recovery. And it was profound. So reminded me of why I went to medical school to begin with, which was to do psychoneuroimmunology. And mm. it took me down that road, you know, to food, to where food comes from, to how we raise our children to what they're exposed to, to what they should be exposed to, and on and on and on. Wow. Wow. So it's, it's beautiful, lovely. I mean, you know, the way it's like you already had it because I always thought that you are a neurologist. And I was wondering why, you know, like you went and so great. And so in your book, you talk a lot about the diverse microbiome, exposure to pets, exposure to dirt. So yeah. would you give a little, uh, you know, like to people who are listening, because it's like, you know, don't touch that. It's dirty. Sanitizer, clean your hands, you know, <laughs> like... So yeah. if I would love to know your uh, viewpoints. Well, yeah, I mean, we've been taught that avoiding things is the best way to raise children and to live, right? And um, so, you know, bleach and hand sanitizer and this, you know, really very interestingly, as we were moving in the direction of letting kids have more exposures and more dirt and talking about the microbiome, the pandemic really blew that up, right? In certain ways with all of the isolation and all of the masking and all of the uh, various ways that, you know, we went backwards. Um, but what we know is we have 
about three to five pounds of microscopic organisms that live in and on our body and in a, in a healthy adult. And in children, you know, there are, are, there's a necessity really for being exposed, not just to microbes, but to diverse microbes. And the reason that's important. So we're learning more and more, in fact, that, um, you know, when I first started doing this, I'll just back up. When I was looking into it for my son, there was no gut brain connection. I mean, only the most renegade people were talking about it. It wasn't on the cover of the New York Times. You know, I mean, now you can find tens of thousands of papers, you know, in, in the scientific literature. When I first started looking at this, it was very early and not public yet. Um, but what we know now is, <clears throat> first of all, that our our guts and our immune systems are very social and they want lots and lots and lots of exposures. They want diverse compounds, like different kinds of foods. They want lots of different organisms. This is part of the education, ongoing, lifelong of our immune systems and it turns out of our brains. And that begins in a very intensive way in infancy and childhood. So there are these window periods, these critical periods of plasticity during the early years of life in which exposures to lots of different organisms are exceptionally more important even than later in life. And it's always important. But in childhood, for example, having pets in early childhood changes the nature of that person's immune system for life. How the child is born, whether by C-section or vaginal delivery, changes that child's immune system for their life. Now, there are definitely things we can do to mitigate and all of that. It's not like, oh, you know, you didn't have a pet in childhood. Well, too bad, you know. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, there are ways to mitigate it. But what ultimately I'm saying from the early part of life is it sets the stage and gives you an advantage or maybe a disadvantage. And we all have some advantages and some disadvantages. Um, but it really is a very, very important part of the education of our guts and our immune systems. And ultimately what we've learned is that our, our nervous system, our brains are totally intimately connected with the organisms that are in and on our body. So there's a, a constant communication between bacteria, for example, and mitochondria. Mitochondria actually, you know, billions of years ago evolved from bacteria and oh. they communicate mitochondria and Bacteria still communicate through quorum sensing, which is how bacteria communicate with one another. So there is this whole conversation going on between bacteria and mitochondria all over the body. And this is one of the ways that this gut brain connection, right? How is the brain developing? The development, the cognition, the mood, the sleep, the focus, right? All of these things are reliant on this bacteria and mitochondrial connection and communication. And it's not just bacteria, of course, it's also viruses. It's also fungi. It's also yeast. A lot of things that we've really vilified over the years. And even now, right, when we had the pandemic, I mean, there was a lot of hysteria and it turns out it probably impacted children for the, for the worse. Um, all things considered. But again, like I said, there's always ways to mitigate. Hmm. So it means that there's a big, big, big connection between what we eat and how that impacts the child's focus, attention, everything. You went through a lot of, as you said, you know, with your son, you had to go through so many people and allergy tests and everything. How would a parent know, you know, like as in how does someone get started? Ki, oh, the problem is in the gut, or you know, like what are some of the signs that they would know? Well, so what I'll say is any child that has something neurologic, 
or something immunologic or something skin, there's something going on in the gut. The gut is at the root of a lot of what happens in the body. So it's never the wrong thing to start thinking about food, to start thinking about exposures to organisms. And when I say exposures to organisms, I mean getting out in nature. I mean pets. I mean um, not using bleach in your house. I mean washing your dishes with a sponge and not with the dishwasher, right? There's a lot of data on all of these things. Um, you know, letting your kids get dirty, literally the dirt cure, right? So all of this is is part of the picture, but um, but it's never the wrong thing to be thinking about diet and to be thinking about what's going on in the digestive tract. Oh, and also, you know, antibiotics, right? Like a lot of the kids that I've seen over the years have, you know, started with antibiotics, maybe during the birth process, right? Like maybe mom needed to get antibiotics or she had an infection and mm. breastfed, et cetera. Right. Or, um, antibiotics for ear infections or antibiotics, right? So like lots of frequent antibiotics oftentimes, or even one a year, right? I'd see the kid when they're maybe eight, 10 years old, one a year would be 10 rounds of antibiotics. And what we know now is it can take up to six years for the microbiome to rebound. Oh, from six years. One, anywhere from one to six years depending okay. on, you know, the, the role taken. So, you know, just to say for a parent, as a general rule, my answer to your question would generally be the people who I've seen have children who do the best when they get a diagnosis or are suffering from some kind of significant issue are the ones who don't accept no for an answer. <laughs> and that's asking a lot, right? It's asking a lot of people. Um, and I would like to remind you, I'm a, I'm a doctor, right? And I was going through that. I mean, at the time I was a, a fellow um, in neurology. So I was very close to being an, the, this, the expert, the colleague of all these people, and I was still dismissed by them. So it doesn't matter, in a sense, who you are, where you come from. Mm -hmm. It matters how determined you are to pursue what your child needs, or if it's you, what you need. And, you know, if they say, well, this is just how it is to say no. And, and I will say over the years, the families I've seen who, who, you know, lost their diagnoses, you know, like autism, for example, or autoimmunity or any number of other things are the ones who who just wouldn't stop. They wouldn't stop. They wouldn't say, oh, okay, that's just how it is. They would say, no, I don't accept this. And, uh, or I don't accept this prognosis, right? Um, and they, and they pursued it and they were tireless. Before you go, I wanted to help you, to help your child improve faster. Here are four things that you can do. One, you can subscribe to my channel so that whatever tips, strategies, insights, whatever I share, they come to you as notifications into your inbox and you are updated on a weekly basis. Two, you can buy my book, Looking Beyond Labels, Becoming a Mindful Parent. It is available on Amazon. It's a guidebook. It will guide you on really, really, really how to help you to help your child better. Three, I've done a lot of masterclasses which are all available as recordings on my website kushi.net.in forward slash online hyphen events. You will be able to refer to a lot of courses related to sleep, toilet and potty training, sensory diet, oral motor challenges, emotional wellness and so many of those. And then number four would be we can meet and I can guide you. We can meet weekly. I meet parents weekly for some of my courses, which you can find on kushi.net.in forward slash events. And we can meet weekly. You get to ask me your questions. I share what to do, how to help. And it's all done in a group setup. It's an amazing deep dive trying to understand your child. And I'm, I'm sure it transforms your perspective it transforms the way you work with your child and these are the four things that i feel would really help you thank you